okay hello friends so hope you all are doing great uh, we are getting lots of requests to create uh, videos on uh, product owner business analyst so here we are uh, this session is full of uh, scenario based product owner interview questions which is i would say must for any product owner or business analyst so do watch this video till end you will definitely get uh, value out of it and before we start uh, friends at the end of the session uh, if you get any benefit please hit like uh it will really shows us that our uh, effort which we are putting uh is making any sense to you guys so please do that and if you are coming first time on our channel please browse couple of other videos and if you find it interesting please subscribe uh, as we are bringing lot of industry experts on our channel time to time you can just go and watch you will find lot of valuable content out there okay so without wasting time so guys yes, time to introduce today's guest and uh, his name is sumit mukherjee uh, currently he is playing a role of product owner at uh, taviska it's a division of jp morgan chase and he is having 9 plus of uh, total it experience and today he is going to help us uh, in ey product owner interview questions uh, these questions are shared by our one of our uh, subscriber channel subscriber in the past so today sumit is going to help us with all those questions so welcome sumit and thanks for accepting our invitation and help our viewers in this journey as a product owner so welcome thanks, sumit hi thanks sumit pleasure to okay, be here okay sumit so why don't you tell us about little bit about yourself before we start uh, the q and a session sure sure yeah. yeah first of all thanks for the opportunity um i think so this is a very uh, good initiative that you have um so yeah i'm sumit uh, i have like you said i mean Uh, around nine years of work experience, primarily playing the role of product owner, business analyst, a bit of management consulting as well. I've uh, been in various domains from banking to media broadcasting um, to travel and hospitality. So currently, I'm a uh, part of Taviska, um, and essentially, I'm handling handling couple of um, important products um, as part of their loyalty platform, uh, which is part of J.P. Morgan and Chase. So essentially, I'm part of the consumer and community banking. And yeah, it's almost been three years at JP Morgan uh, slash Tavista. Yeah. Thanks, Sumit, for that. Okay. Okay. So, Sumit, shall we start our Q and A questions? Sure. Let's go. Ahead. Okay. Okay. So, uh, what comes to your mind when you think of your role as a product owner? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so, I think so. Frankly, as a product owner. You're essentially, uh, you know, required to play a lot of different roles. I would say uh, one thing which is important for a product owner is essentially having ac accountability, uh, because you are essentially owning the product backlog, the uh, you know running the product vision across the product backlog. So that's an important thing. And also, you know, as a product owner, you will be uh, required to wear multiple hats. So be it as an investigator trying to understand what is wrong with your product, improvement opportunities. uh being some sort of a data scientist you know running through metrics running through how the performances are how product is doing well in the market that is an important thing and also things like you know being sort of an artist or a uh, ux centric uh, you know person wherein you will have to understand what, how the design uh, is of the product um how is it speaking to your customers what are the pain points so i think so that is pretty important as a product owner trying and understanding what are the different roles and wearing them at the uh, wearing the right hat at the right time and also one important thing i think so which uh, a product owner brings and it is uh, distinct from other roles is essentially having that idea of design thinking wherein you are empathizing with your users you are essentially defining your product roadmap and your product backlog your testing hypothesis in an iterative manner so bringing that uh, level of empathy understanding your users understanding their pain points their jobs uh that is a very important thing and as a product owner you get to essentially play all these different roles okay thanks uh, sumit for that okay and is it uh, necessary to have a product vision to be able to successful as a product owner what is your take on that yeah so what i would say is um, i mean it definitely helps in terms of understanding where your product wants to be not only you but the team itself so that means it helps in your prioritization uh, decisions um you know product vision helps you understand or at least uh, you know make sure that you are investing in the right uh, initiatives in the right feature 
uh, without a product vision you are you are essentially running the risk of investing in different different features which essentially don't talk together so your vision or your you know effort can be sort of disjointed um so that is important uh, as for a product i mean having a product vision i wouldn't say it is you need to have a formal product document or a vision document uh, circulated within the team but it is imperative that you and your team understand uh, where your product wants to be not only what it, it is today um because what you'll see is your team also would eventually be uh, you know running various experiments uh, they would be taking uh, trade off decisions between implementation approaches and a product vision helps understand in terms of what approach or what experiments they should be uh, doing so that they can eventually achieve uh, that uh, product vision so yeah i would say it is important um, i mean and uh, i mean at the very base basic i mean need of a, the basic thing that a product uh, vision helps is to understand where you essentially need to go having a sort of a north star for your product and having that Uh, sort of joined and um, defined vision helps your product versus you know uh, there can be external forces which might uh, alter your vision or your uh, approaches that you're currently having so i would say it is important and uh, it definitely helps yes sumit uh, though this uh, question is not asked in ey but again it's my uh, curiosity i just want to check with you if you can just share like maybe a one or two example of a vision so that our uh, viewers who are watching this video they can understand okay this is a vision then you will drive a goal and then maybe you know something like that if you just want to share any one or two example from your past project it will be great yeah i mean uh, product vision essentially is where your organization or where your product wants to be um essentially there's a term called as uh, big hairy audacious goals which essentially talk about things or uh, very audacious statements which you know rally help your team rally and achieve them so to give an example amazon has a very simple product vision essentially to be uh, the best or the best customer centric company in the world um, and that is a very easy vision to get behind to you essentially know where amazon's priorities lie and you can see it in your experiences with amazon product as well their customer care the returns policy all those kinds of things uh, and yeah so what happens is your vision is your north star or essentially your you know uh, long term uh, you know area of expertise where you want your product to be and that helps drive your goals your strategic themes essentially then your epics and features and your product backlog so that is the essentially hierarchy uh, depending on organizations i would say so in my past organizations we we've used a product vision to uh, define uh, strategic themes and also uh, business objectives so you essentially want to ask questions as to why are you not achieving your vision today what would help you achieve that your vision today and that essentially helps you define your kpis your business objectives and then you drill them down into initiatives and they get down into epics and features so that is one useful way uh, vision helps without a vision essentially you are investing in anything i mean take an example of a uh, um, you know of a food delivery app so today swiggy uh, is purely uh, is uh, into food delivery as well as grocery delivery but if you look at zomato they are purely into food delivery as of today so that speaks of a more coherent vision versus swiggy which might have a vision which is about essentially having multiple product lines or multiple uh, business models under under their product so yeah that helps without a vision you essentially don't know where you want to invest in so that helps okay thanks a lot uh, sumit for the great uh, detailed explanation yeah. okay so this question is uh, i would say uh, yeah it's a product owner question but it's also a question from a scrum team perspective and we really want to know uh, from this question that at what stage do you involve the scrum team in the product discovery process or i would say how you you are doing the product discovery process and and how you will involve the scrum team yeah um so there are two parts to this uh, essentially uh, what i would say is if you look at um your product and your product backlog there are two main sources of new features or new requests one is essentially your clients or customers and they uh, are more of you know achieving their business needs and their uh, business goals and then there is a second one wherein you're trying to identify product features or improvement areas 
uh, which eventually is part of your ideation uh, cycle, wherein you go from ideation to hypothesis testing to a product increment and eventual rollout. Um, but what you would see is many of these ideation essentially come from the team itself because uh, you and your team are essentially working on your product on a day-to-day -day basis. So you'll always come across uh, improvement opportunities. There would be some experiments which your team would like to do. Um, so in that sense, your team is always contributing to the backlog, uh, having different ideas, and that would essentially go into a discovery where you as a PO uh, would ideally you know, play a role or would help in this is essentially trying to find what is the product fit. Uh, we talked about vision and aligning to vision. So how does your product and this feature align to the goals and the visions of the product? So that is where you need to be. Um, what you need to do is define uh, and design spikes or you know different uh, experiments which you can, uh, which your team can run to see whether uh, the discovery process is fruitful, whether this product feature helps or not. And that is also where your team would help, right? So one uh, technique which I use is an impact matrix. So you have obviously the impact on the product vision versus what is the feasibility. So things which are not very feasible, uh, but still they are in obviously high value. You might want to defer them to further releases or in the future, but things which are very feasible and also very uh, highly impactful, you would want to obviously have them high in your backlog. And that uh, area or that aspect of feasibility or effort is where your team uh, you know, essentially would have uh, that input in. So whenever you're designing your experiments, one of your outputs should be what is the impact of it? What is the feasibility of it? Uh, so yeah, it's basically as soon as possible, whenever you're designing your ideas, your team should be involved, I, I would say. Hey, great. Uh, thanks so much for that. Okay. And this one is again very interesting and uh, very basic question, honestly. So how do you align the product roadmap with the product backlog and the user stories? How you break all these things? Yeah. Um, again, I mean, there are two aspects to this. Uh, if you talk about, um, if you're just talking about aligning your product, uh, I mean, user stories to your product roadmap, uh, you're essentially looking at a good uh, requirements management tool, Light Road, Roadmap, or even uh, Jira, which allows you to create your roadmaps, uh, your different uh, epics in the roadmap, and obviously drill down user stories from them. And these requirements management tool essentially have that inherent capability of tracking and having that traceability between your epics and features to the stories. Uh, but if you're talking in terms of how do you uh, essentially build a roadmap and drill it down into user stories, I would say as a product owner, you are going to uh, mostly work in three different uh, tracks. One is the discovery track, so which is the absolute topmost. So discovery track is where you're talking to various stakeholders, uh, various customers, various, your marketing channels, your sales channels, uh, different product teams, and trying to understand what are the improvement areas, what are the new feature requests, and be it part of your product backlog. So uh, that is your first path. The second would be essentially your refinement phase. Uh, so refinement phase is essentially talking to the UX team, uh, having you know some secondary research, trying and seeing whether these features are good, trying and adding more detail to these uh, you know features and epics, and that would be your refined product backlog. So your uh, discovery track and your uh, refinement track, they can range anyone anywhere between running every iteration to every four to five iterations. I would say that every four to five iterations, it's a good practice to look at your product backlog and see if there are any future requests, you know, which are going to be a uh, good value add. And then you obviously refine them. And then you come at the last track, which is your delivery track, right? Which you do on a day-to-day -day basis, which is obviously every iteration, all the cadences, right? From sprint planning to demos, uh, and then you roll out your product increment. So, and this happens every sprint. So what you would want to do it every sprint is, you know, if you don't have a healthy backlog, you always go back to your product roadmap, seeing what are the features that you have designed, uh, what are the uh, different epics that you have picked up, and then essentially you want to break it down. You want to obviously pick up only epics which are in the new future. Um, there are techniques like functional decomposition. Um, so if your product is 
broken down into various components or functions, you, it is an easy way to break down stories. So taking an example of let's say Amazon or even like any e-commerce site, you have various functions like obviously search and you have, you know, uh, booking and then you have obviously checkout, you have payments. So these are the different functions and under each functions, you might treat them as epics also, and then you can break them down further. So each uh, function would have its own track and the ones which obviously are a high priority, which you feel needs to be earlier in your roadmap that you can break down first. So, so it, this is also called as rolling wave, wherein you each, after each wave, you try and hit your uh, roadmap, break down your roadmap as into stories as soon as possible, uh, while concentrating at only the near term items and refining the long term items only at a scale, which you know makes sense rather than going into too much detail. Great, uh, great, Sumit, for this detailed explanation. Okay, so uh, friends, this next question is uh, totally a challenging question. It's a completely a behavioral kind of question. And if you're not ready, prepared for that, you will be stumped. Okay, so Sumit, uh, here's the question. So how do you know that you are a good product owner? Yeah, or I would say uh, when you are, let's say, taking an interview of other product owners, right? How yeah. do you identify that? Okay, what are the good traits of a good product owner, or you know something like that, based on your experience? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we talked at the absolute starting wherein as a product owner you are supposed to have um, uh, different perspectives. You have to have the ability to play dis different uh, perspectives. Uh, like we talked about, you know, having an analytical approach, having a design approach, uh, right from design thinking, having obviously a data driven approach, those kinds of things, and obviously having a good uh, product sense. That is the most important thing for a product owner. Uh, do you use products which essentially, you know, you can, you uh, know what are the pros and cons of the product? I mean, uh, can you, are you very, very well versed with the product that you are working on in terms of understanding what are the pain points? Um, you have various data points in terms of marketing, sales, your team themselves, customers, but can you collate them together into defining a coherent uh, roadmap, a coherent vision in terms of defining, okay, these, these are the different data points and this is how the product needs to be. So that is an important thing. Um, you uh, One good way, and you talked about interviews. Uh, so I think so case studies is a, is a good way to, you know, uh, become a good, good product owner. If you look at different case studies in the industry, how Spotify got big, how Nokia fell, these kinds of different product uh, products, if you study them, try and having that product sense into time and understand what helps and what uh, is, you know, um, the good features of it. Essentially, it's value proposition, which helps define it uh, or distinct, uh, make it distinct from other products. That is a good thing. Um, also, I would say in terms of in your day-to-day -day things, uh, judging for yourself. So, uh, your I would say as a product owner, uh, you you would be judged based on the success of your product itself, right? Uh, no matter all the uh, skills and certifications you have, if you are if your product itself isn't uh, meeting its KPIs, if it's not meeting the vision, then that is not a good look in yourself. So, uh, although it is a very subjective uh, answer in terms of what is a good product owner. One good way to see uh, that uh, you are uh, you are doing the right job is whether your product is meeting its uh, you know its goals, and uh, that means as a product owner you need to define the right leading indicators, your right, uh, right lagging indicators. Um, so to, to give you a very simple example, um, you know we obviously all track our weight and we are very uh, fitness conscious people. So weight is an example of a lagging indicator, right? It is something which has already happened. You know, this is your weight and you have a target which you want to achieve it. And to in order to achieve that target, you do certain initiatives or do something like, like tracking your calorie intakes, number of, of I mean, uh, uh, exercises that you do in a day. What is the time you spend uh, doing exercises? So these are examples of lead, uh, leading indicators. So similarly, as a product also, you would see profit or sales. These are essentially past events, which are your lagging indicators. You need to define the right product metrics in those sense. And also, what are you trying to achieve uh, in terms of where you want to be? So having the right mix of leading and lagging indicators is a good way. And if your product is meeting most of those metrics, I would say you're a good product owner. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Sumit, for that. Okay. So uh, this is a little bit uh, tricky in terms of uh, conflict management or managing expectation. 
So this question is, let's suppose you have one stakeholder uh, who is very demanding in terms of, or he has some authority, uh, maybe from a client perspective, right? And in the past, historically, we know that this uh, individual have received, uh, uh, however, I mean, for whatever reason, he has uh, received some preferential treatment in the past uh, during for feature prioritization and all those things. And, uh, but as a product owner, you are the owner of that product, right? You may have different perspective with respect to that particular product. So how you manage expectation when we have a lot of stakeholders and everyone is demanding and everyone to push their uh, features first, right? Yeah. So yeah, Sumit, your take on that. Yeah, so what I would say is, I mean, if it's uh, just a specific individual, which uh, has a very, um, like you said, you know, um, a higher degree of influence over uh, your product decisions. Uh, the first question you need to ask yourself is obviously, uh, how valid are those requests? So, I mean, if you feel that those valid requests and those are valid requests and they need to be part of a product vision, then there's nothing um, doing about that. But what I would say is that, uh, and you talked about multiple stakeholders. So there is, um, I mean, one exercise which you can do, not maybe formally, but even roughly is uh, trying to track the impact and influence of each stakeholder. So what is the impact the, your stakeholder has in terms of decision-making, in terms of prioritization, and what is the influence also uh, um, they have? So essentially people, those who have high influence, you want to manage them better. Um, and ones which have, lower influence, you would probably want to just, you know, keep them informed. And if the specific individuals or individuals are people you feel that although they have high influence, but their product features are detrimental to your product, they are, they don't have that much value. Um, you can always uh, sit with them, try and understand or elaborate on the features, uh, help them understand or maybe, maybe try and design spikes or experiments, which would help uh, define the hypothesis uh, whether you know these features would actually help your product or not so that you're not uh, investing in the wrong product so what you would do is uh, talk to the stakeholders trying and understand okay this is what you want so can we have a small analysis um, uh, user story can we have a small experimentation user story where we we maybe roll out a small variation of this feature try and see whether it's actually catching on or not so those kinds of things you can always do and uh, in terms of people management obviously as a product owner or as a business analyst you need to have those features so you uh, or anyways uh, you know probably in discussions with your stakeholders with your sponsors and uh, your sponsors are a key stakeholders because they are the ones who are sponsoring and financing your entire product so you need to talk to them tell them you know these are the different requests from these people and uh, these are the features you feel they are not as important but they still probably are highly demanded and then you obviously leave it to the sponsor if your sponsor feels that this is uh, not aligned then obviously you would have those conversations together with the sponsor with the stakeholder yourself uh, detailing the case why you feel these are not uh, stories which you need to pick up right now maybe in the future or if the sponsor feel that, okay, these are aligned to your product goals, then obviously you go ahead with them. But at the same time, even like we talked about product sense, even if you feel that these are not really technically talking to the soul of the product, you have experiments. The more hypothesis testing you have in your product, the more experimentations you do, the more you're failing, the more you're learning about your product. So that is a very important thing versus just, you know, uh, listing down whatever requests are coming in your backlog and then picking up for the sprint, rolling it down and then coming to know, okay, you failed. That is a more expensive proposition versus having a shorter iteration cycle wherein you first test it versus uh, then, you know, probably take, you know, take on the story. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, Sumit, for that. Okay, so the next one is again a very interesting one. So, and I think it's a, Sometimes it's a real scenario. It had happened a lot of time. So now let's suppose that your stakeholder do not understand how to articulate the business value okay. uh, with the specific data. You might have seen this kind of scenario a lot of time that they have some weak uh, requirement in their mind. So could you please help us uh, that what uh, practices or what improvements which you can bring uh, or you can suggest to your client in order to uh, come up with a proper uh, requirement? So if you can throw some light on that, it, that would be great, Sumit. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So um, so what I would say is what we need to understand is business value estimation is essentially 
more of a prioritization exercise wherein you are ranking various business. Uh, I mean, it can be at any level you are doing the activity. It can be at an epic level or a feature level. So you are essentially trying and ranking these features, right? When you're assigning a business value to them. So in my experience in the products I've handled, business value estimations ideally shouldn't be that complicated because your end objective is trying to rank those products. So your techniques can be as simple as gathering all those stakeholders, all the business heads into a single room and trying and ranking them together with obviously your sponsor who has the ultimate uh, approval of that uh, product. Uh, that can be the basic way. I mean, just having a simple voting mechanism, right? Or you can, uh, there are other uh, techniques also where you can do, there is a very collaborative technique called as a business value estimation game. Uh, so you're in what you do is you essentially give uh, some sort of obviously fake currency to each and every business stakeholder. And then you have a list of epics, right? So 10, 15 epics that you would like to do. And then you explain each and every epic to this forum. And then you ask these business stakeholders to essentially put some of, amount of money or some amount of value against each of these. So what you are uh, technically trying uh, or asking these guys to do is how much money would you invest in each of these features? So that would essentially tell you, you know, people where, in, where they are uh, willing to put money more. So that's a very collaborative uh, and interesting way to do it. And and these techniques are, I think, so very easy to understand for stakeholders. And for if you have a complicated way of, uh, uh, I mean, having business value estimations and your stakeholders have problem following it, then probably there is a problem with the technique itself. I mean, your approach versus what the stakeholders are doing. So you can look at ways of improving that technique. I mean, how you can make it more relatable, more easier. Um, you can link it to, uh, also we talked about KPIs, you can link it to actual customer metrics in terms of sales, in terms of show, um, what is the you know uh, net profit that you're doing, um, what is the, if, if it's an app, the uh, downloads, um, the ratings on uh, Play Stores, those kinds of things are hard tangible things which you can obviously track and have good business value. So, I mean, if you have um, uh, let's say a product, which is, I mean, we talked about an app, so maybe having a feature and if let's say your business vision is to have a number of downloads. So probably a marketing would have a higher feature value because, you know, you want to invest more in marketing, ha having that initial consumer uptake versus something which is related to performance, which can probably defer it to later. And anyways, things like performance are uh, better, you know, fed by the initial set of customers themselves, you know, the issues they are facing. Uh, so those kinds of things is a better, a good way to do it. And you can do, like I said, in my experience, the most simple, the, the most simpler the technique, the more easier it is to convey and evangelize it across your entire organization. So things like voting or even a business value estimation game, uh, most of the time should do the trick. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, uh, Sumit, for this wonderful explanation. So friends, uh, we have uh, covered seven questions and we have nine more questions. And uh, this is uh, part one of our uh, session. We have part two very soon with Sumit. So if you have uh, reached the end of the session, please hit subscribe because you will get notification in future. And don't forget to hit like. And thanks, Sumit, for your time. Thanks, we'll see you me. soon in our next session. Thanks.